Manadium is one of the best decks in Yu-Gi-Oh, so today I'm going to teach you how to beat it. What's up, Ocean? You got Matt here, and welcome back to another competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! video. Manadium is the newest piece of the Visa Starfrost lore, and while it's nowhere near the same power level as Full Power Kashtira and Full Power Tier Limits, it still is a very feared combo deck with a lot of good matchups today. If you're looking to play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! and you don't know how to play against Manadium, then you're going to have a pretty hard time. So in this video, I'll show you the best cards to play against Manadium, when to use those cards, the choke points and weaknesses of the deck, and then what decks are best suited to beat Manadium in today's format. So if you're excited for the video and for the How to Beat series, then make sure to smash the like button. If this video hits 75 likes, then I'll know you want to see more guides on how to beat other meta decks. Also, if you like deck profiles, combo guides, discussion videos, and competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! videos just like this one, you're going to love this channel. So make sure to subscribe and help us reach our end of year goal of 2,000 subscribers. Now, with that being said, here's the ultimate guide on how to beat Manadium in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Let's jump into it. So the first thing we have to talk about is what is a Manadium player looking to actually do with their game plan? But before we do that, we have to talk about what the deck itself actually looks like. The deck itself doesn't really utilize too much non-engine because it's a very heavily engine-oriented deck. The good news, cards like Kashtira Fenrir can actually be used as non-engine in this strategy, but also are really good to search out actual engine pieces, which is obviously fantastic. The main cards in the deck are going to be your level 4s in Manadium Roomheart, Scareclaw Rykart, and then Visa Samsara, which just came out in Age of Overlord. You're also going to see the level 6 of Visa Starfrog, which is going to be your tuner and the main piece in the deck that gets all of your plays going and is required to really play the deck. And then of course there are three copies of our Manadium Meek, and the reason we play three copies of this one here is because it is the best of all the Manadium balls out there. The deck is very heavily field spell reliant, you actually play pretty much all four copies of the planet field spells. You play the peaceful planet, you play the primitive planet, you play the primeval planet, and you play the pressure planet. All of them are seeing play right now in Manadium. The Pressure Planet Wraith Soft is not seeing as much right now, but every single other one is seeing a good amount of play. There are, of course, going to be your Manadium Spells and Traps, including Manadium Abscission, Manadium Imaginings, there's going to be the Counter Trap in Manadium Reframing, and of course, two copies usually of Scareclaw Arrival as your Reborn that's in Archetype. The rest of the deck is going to be non-engine, and most of the time you end up with eight or nine spots for non-engine in this current format. The main forms of interruption are going to be coming from the extra deck in the form of cards like Barone and Vistal Dispater. Of course, cards like Appaloosa and Vicious Astrolaut also have their home in this deck as well. With this deck, the Manadium player's game plan is looking to be able to create a massive end board that is going to be full of interruptions so that you can't actually play the game. Going second, they're looking to OTK you, and they can do that pretty easily, mostly because they're now playing a copy of Nightmare Unicorn and a copy of Axis Code Talker, which can easily get to 5300 attack thanks to the Nightmare Unicorn in their extra deck. That pair with a Vicious Astrolaut is going to be enough damage to get the guaranteed KO on you pretty much right away. The Manadium M board can vary quite a bit, but most of the time you're going to be ending on at least two copies of Barone or Vicious Dispater, even Appaloosa Bow the Goddess, and of course the Hot Red Dragon, Archfiend King Calamity to just win the game right away. The way they get to this end board is by a combination of the Visus Monsters and the Manadium Orbs. These cards pair really well because they're just constantly destroying one another, and that'll allow you to get access to so much more bodies on the board to go into powerful synchros and link summons. And after that, they can just banish a 1500 attack, 2100 defense monster, and a Visa Starfrost from their graveyard to summon out a Vicious Astrolaut, which is going to be able to pop a card on the field right away. This is typically what an end board looks like for Manadium. You're going to see most of the time is going to be the Appaloosa with at least three materials on it. You're going to see a Barone de Floor and then a Synchro 10 of choice, usually a Bissel Dispater or maybe a Chengying. You're also going to see possibly Manadium Reframing set, which is the counter trap that protects you from cards like Evenly Mashed and Dark Ruler No More. And then of course, you're going to see the field spell in hand and material engraved for the next turn to be able to use to banish for Vicious Astrolaut on the crackback. It's such an imposing board, and honestly, the best way around it is going to be to use hand traps to prevent them from getting this far. Speaking of hand traps, these are the ones we're going to be talking about today and how they work when compared to a deck like Manadium. Starting off with Ash Blossom. Ash is a great card. It can stop so much in the Manadium deck. The problem is, you really want to save it for the right time. You should be stopping anything that would lead them to going more than plus one in card advantage. You should be ashing something like Obsession, especially if they target a Manadium Meek. If you let this go through, then yes, technically they go neutral on card advantage, but Peaceful Planet Clarion will get them a search right away, and then even more advantage when a face of tuner is destroyed. For that reason, don't bother hitting the field spells with Ash Blossom, they're just not high enough impact on their own. Ash can be great though if your opponent has very few extenders, but it can also be basically a wasted card against Manadium if they open well enough. Droll and Lockbird is the best hand trap against Manadium. Pretty much every single card in the deck searches for another card and most Manadium decks right now are playing Fenrir as a way to get to Scareclaw Kashtira. If you hit them with a Droll right there, they can no longer add the Field Spells or Arrival or anything off of Roomheart. Many decks this format are weak to or at least annoyed by Droll, so it's going to see a lot of play. It should definitely be in most side decks right now, but if there's going to be a lot of Manadium in your area, I recommend possibly even putting it into your main deck. Onto Infinite Impermanence, Effect Dealer, and Ghost Mourner by extension. All these cards are fine, they can be pretty low impact at times since the deck is almost all extenders. 
There are some applications where it's really good. I'd recommend using it to stop the light heart, for example, so they can't get the field spell, or even to stop the room heart from getting them whatever card they need. But realistically, Imperm and Veiler are at their best in this matchup when they're paired with another hand trap, notably Nibiru. Imperm is pretty clearly the best card of these three options here, and for multiple reasons, but one of the biggest ones is going to be that if you draw this card as your sixth card, then you can hit either the Appaloosa or the Barone make right away to get rid of Interruption on your turn. Nibiru can be an awesome card against Manadium, but it really depends on where you're going to be doing it. Depending on their hand, Manadium can pretty easily get to a Monster Negate by their fifth summon, and if you have Nib in your hand, then you really have three options of when to use it. The first option is going to be use it as soon as they get material for a Synchro 10, but before they actually summon the Synchro. This is a tough call because if they have the necessary extenders to rebuild their board, they don't can just ignore the fact that you've used Nibiru. Option number two would be to use it as a way to get rid of their one and only Barone negate, which can be good, but you have to do it when Barone is still the only negate they have on field. Option number three, however, is going to be that while they have one form of monster negation paired with Imperm or Veiler to guarantee that Nibiru results. As for Fantastical Dragon Phantasme, the deck Link summons enough with Lightheart, Cross Sheep, and Appaloosa, but there are much more impactful cards against the deck, so I don't recommend playing it. Skullmeister is a really solid card in the meta today, but it's not as impactful against this deck. It can hit the Manadium Balls in Graveyard, but that's really about it, so for right now I would say there are better options to side or even to use against the Manadium deck. Dimension Shifter is a really good card against Manadium. Now, it doesn't completely shut the deck down because they can still make their board under it, but it's nowhere near as threatening as it could have been, and the resources are gone. Also, it prevents them from making Astrolab with their graveyard materials. They can still make it while the Vsauce is on field, but it's not going to be as impactful as if they were to use it from the graveyard. Bistrals are great to get rid of Scareclaw Arrival since it targets and you can also get rid of an extender because of that. You could also hit cards like the Lightheart so it can't be summoned back. It's also important to say that if you do summon a Bistral before they use Scareclaw Right card, summon it in attack position because Right card will get a bonus effect to draw a card only when there are three or more defense position monsters on the field, not just their field. DD Crow is a pretty good card in the meta today, but the only cards it actually hits over the Bistrals in this matchup are going to be the Manadium Balls, and the best way to actually hit them is going to be to stop the Field Spell from recycling them back. In my opinion, in this matchup, if you're looking at DD Crow or Bistrals, just play the Bistrals in my mind. As for Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, in my opinion, the only place that you should be using Bell in this matchup is going to be against Manadium Trisukta, the new Synchro from Age of Overlord, and you can always just Imperm it or Veiler it instead, so I would not recommend using this card instead of others. Ghost Ogre is good because it gets the body off the field, but it's bad since there are always going to be extenders to play through it. At the best case, it's one fewer piece of interruption on the end board, and at the worst case, it's an absolute neg one for you. Moving on to Board Breakers, these are the ones we're going to be covering today. Now, I'll be honest with you, board breakers are great against Manadium, but they're not going to be as good as hand traps in my opinion. And the reason for that is while the end board has already been created, there's going to be multiple forms of negation. So you have to have multiple board breakers to get through it. And on top of that, your opponent doesn't only have monsters as forms of negation. They do have access to Manadium reframing, which can shut down cards like Forbidden Droplets and Dark Ruler No More, which can be responded to by monsters depending on the situation. Starting off with Evenly Mashed, all Evenly does is bait out a negate. Now granted, if you get rid of the Barone negate earlier and the counter trap, then this can do a lot of cleanup duty, but it's super unlikely since that counter trap is going to be saved specifically for Dark Ruler No More or Evenly Matched. Moving on to Dark Ruler No More, if they don't specifically have reframing the counter trap, Dark Ruler is going to be the best card you can possibly have against this matchup. It is so good, it's an absolutely free card that can allow you to break their board very easily. Kaijus are great in this format, but against Manadium, they're not as strong. Most end boards have two synchros at least, which is tough because if you get rid of one of them with a kaiju, you don't turn off reframing, since reframing does require you to have a synchro on board field to activate its effect. You can, however, get rid of a three material Appaloosa, which can be better in a lot of situations. Lava Golem against Manadium is better than kaijus, and honestly, it's probably better than kaijus in this format in general. The problem is you have to be using a deck that doesn't need a normal summon, and not every deck can do that, but if your deck can take advantage of it, definitely side in Lava Golem against Manadium. As for Sphere, mode, this is one of the few decks of the format where I actually argue it's better than Lava Golem and Kaijus. The best combo of the deck going uninterrupted has at least three monsters on field, and if you can get rid of them with Sphere Mode, you're in a great situation. Change of Heart only baits out a negate on the Barone or the Reframing, so on its own, it does nothing. It needs to be paired with a hand that's either all gas or a lot of other board breakers to actually be effective. Triple Tactic Talents is weird in this matchup, because on the one hand, they're never going to let Talents actually resolve, but on the other hand, if they already use their Barone, then they need to use Reframing, or you can get rid of another big threat. Kashtir Fenrir is an awesome card that sees a lot of play right now. The problem is, it only forces out multiple negates in this matchup when it's paired with another card. Since Fenrir is a monster and not a spell or a trap, it's going to be below average most of the time because the end board for Manadium is going to be very monster negate heavy. As for board wise like Raigeki, Dark Hole, Lightning Storm, and Harvey's Feather Duster, they can always force out a negate, but if it resolves, you'll likely win the game on the spot, assuming your engine in hand is actually good enough. 
Of these four options, Harpy's Feather Duster is the worst one against this matchup since the only thing you're actually going to be hitting is going to be the reframing and there are much more impactful options against it. As for Cosmic Cyclone, it's a pretty good board breaker in general, just against Manadium it's actually better going first than it is going second so that way you can stop their field spells from resolving. Now that we've covered some of the most generic hand traps and board breakers, let's talk about cards that we should be bringing in going first. Starting off of course with Summon Limits. Manadium always needs two or more summons so they can get into all their plays. If you hit them with a summon limit after their second summon, they can't really do anything. It's such a blowout against this deck. Droll and Lockbird will always be good against this deck, and there's no real downside to having it if you're going first or going second. Deck Lockdown is basically additional copies of Droll and Lockbird. It prevents either player from adding from their deck to their hand and from summoning from the deck directly. So it turns off a card like a Hero Lives if anyone still plays that engine, and it turns off all the searching the deck does. It's not necessarily only for Manadium, it's really good against decks like Dragon Link, Unchained, Purely and more, so it definitely makes sense to have it in your side deck. Baguska is not a bad option if you can't make enough of a good board going first, and for that reason it should be able to buy you at least a turn against this deck, which can be all you need to just swing the game in your favor. Finally, Dimensional Barrier is obviously a fantastic card because they do use quite a bit of synchros in their combo. Now while stopping synchros is great, they can still OTK you if they play the Nightmare Unicorn plus Axis Code combo, since Astral Auto plus an Axis Code with a Link 3 as material is over 8k life points. Going second, we have cards like Droll and Lockbird. Obviously, this card is fantastic, I've mentioned it a few times today. We also have cards that tribute, like the Lava Golem, the Sphere Mode, and of course the Kaijus, but I prefer the Lava Golem and the Sphere Mode if your deck can take advantage of it. And finally, Dark Ruler No More and Forbidden Droplet are two great cards against the deck, assuming you have the discards available for Droplet, and assuming that you can get rid of the reframing on Dark Ruler No More. As for the choke points and weaknesses of the deck, there are three that I want to cover today. The first of which is going to be Visa Starfrost. If you can get rid of this card completely, then it's going to be very hard for them to actually get to their end board, because what they want to do is continuously recycle the Visa Starfrost over and over. So if you can banish it with DD Crow or Abyssal, it makes it very hard for them to be able to get extra material on board for Synchros and for Link Summons. The second choke point of the deck is going to be, in my opinion, Visus and Ritara for two reasons. The first of which is going to be that on Summon, it can search for any spell or trap, which is going to be really good because it can get all your plays going and it can also get you something like reframing for down the line. But the second reason is going to be that while it's on the field, it's treated as a Visus Starfrost, which means you can always link it off into a Lightheart and just continue your plays from there. So if you can imperm a card, this would be the card that I would imperm in my opinion. And the last weakness I'm going to talk about is going to be all the adding from deck to hand or all the searching. The fact that this deck searches so much is an actual weakness for it, even though it's such a huge part of what competitive Yu-Gi-Oh is nowadays. If you can stop them from adding consistently, then you're going to be in a great position to win the game against Manadium. Now let's start talking about decks that have a good matchup against Manadium. The first of which we're going to talk about is going to be Fluanda Reese, and that's going to be for multiple reasons. The first of which is going to be that M-Pen is an absolute house against this deck. You really shut down a lot that the deck wants to do, and by forcing everything into defense position, you don't have a chance of dying on this turn. On top of that, the deck normal summons quite a bit, so if you're able to force your opponent into a normal summon of the Room Heart, for example, then you can trigger your map and be able to normal summon additional cards and then get access to not only your M-Pen, but a card like Ryza to bounce cards back, or a card like Apex Avion to get an extra negate. Purely is also a very tough matchup for Manadium, especially before siding, because before siding, there's no real out that the deck has for an Expert Noir with five or more materials. Now, going second, they're going to have cards like Herald of the Abyss or Xyz Encore, but for the time being, if they don't have those cards, you're going to be able to win pretty easily with Purely, assuming you can get to Expert Noir. The Rescue Ace matchup against Manadium is pretty much a wash here. I would say there's pros and cons for both sides, but Rescue Ace going first can actually create multiple different interruptions to stop the Manadium player, and going second, they don't really need their normal summon, so they can just side in copies of Lava Golem or Sphere Mode and have a really good time against the deck. As for decks that have a bad matchup against Manadium, honestly, any deck that relies heavily on two or three card combos will have a tough time, especially because most of those decks will still have a pretty big choke point at some point in their combo. And the reason why this is a problem is because Manadium puts up so many different negates so it can stop the right one and shut the combo down right in its tracks. Decks that also have very little non-engine space are going to have a hard time against Manadium as well in this format, and the reason for that is going to be that Manadium needs to have multiple pieces of interruption to actually stop it from getting to its full combo. So if you can't have multiple pieces of interruption, then you're going to have a hard time against Manadium going forward. And there you have it. You now know how to beat Manadium in competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Now let me know in the comments, what decks are you playing in this format and how are you planning to beat Manadium going forward? If you made it this far in the video, you must have enjoyed it even just a little bit. So make sure to smash the like button. If this video hits 75 likes, then I'll bring you more guides on how to beat other competitive meta decks. Speaking of meta decks, if you want a guide to all the board breakers in this format and how they interact with each meta deck, then make sure to check out the video right over here. And finally, consider subscribing for more competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! videos just like this one, and of course, help us reach our end of year goal of 2,000 subscribers. I want to thank you all for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all next time.